between the 15th and the 17th century AD. India was the site of a unique synthesis of two cultures, the ancient Hindu and the new Islamic culture, which had been introduced by rulers of Central Asian or Afghan origin. This creative interaction is particularly reflected in marvels of Indian architecture built at that time. One of the places where this fusion flowered in a particularly vivid way is Hoshang Shah's tomb, built by Sultan Hoshang Shah in Mandu. The Islamic dome of this building is conspicuous, yet the flow of movement is structured as in a temple or in a stupa. Since the porch of the tomb faces north, while the entrance is located on the tomb south, the pilgrim has to do a typical pradakshina or circumambulation through the surrounding courtyard before entering the sacred central structure. As if to underscore this fusion, the composition of the entrance combines the pointed Islamic arch with the ancient auspicious lotus motif of India. But it is in the royal palace complex that we find the most striking and innovative building in Mandu, which was built by Sultan Ghiazuddin Khalji, the Jahaz Mahal. The Jahaz Mahal contains three large halls built in the new arch and dome construction system. But here the domes have been covered up and the roof is as flat as in any of the older Indian palaces. The reason? In the hot Indian climate, roof terraces have traditionally been a favoured place for entertainment and repose, especially on winter days and on cool summer nights. A unique feature of the Jahaz Mahal is its two swimming pools. Both pools drew water from the tank at the southern end of the building. Water was lifted to the roof through a pulley and bucket system that no longer exists. Then, the water coursed through a channel situated along the 205 feet of the roof's front facade until it reached the pool at the opposite end of the roof. At the point when this channel enters the pool, there is a remarkable cutout in stone suggesting the intertwining of two snakes. This motif actually stimulates the natural flow and rhythm of the water as it enters the pool. Moreover, this channel also contained a charcoal filter to purify the water. Another outstanding example of medieval planning around water is Udaipur. This city was founded in 1559 as the capital of the Rajput kingdom of Mewar by Rana Uday Singh. In accordance with ancient Hindu practices, the city and the royal palace were built on the eastern bank of Lake Pichola so that the rising sun could be worshipped every morning. The royal palace of Udaipur is aligned with the waterfront, just as the Jahaz Mahal of Mandu. But unlike in Mandu, it isn't spread around a lake. It sits on a hill overlooking Lake Pichola on one side and the old city on the other. Enclosed by fortified gates, it's a fort palace. Its spatial planning was organized around a series of courtyards, a common Indian design solution ideal for the region's hot, dry climate. The outermost court was used for parades, religious festivals or coronation darbars, ceremonies that most of the people of Udaipur attended. Jharokas and chhatris or pavilions that punctuate the upper parts of the walls 
were used by royal princesses to watch the scene below. The courtyards within the palace were used for private royal darbars. They also served as settings for music and dance performances. The higher courtyards on the western sides that were exposed to pleasant breezes from the lake were used for sleeping during the hot summer nights. But it is the uppermost courtyard of this palace that is unique. It contains a swimming pool in a garden. The surprising presence of trees and abundant vegetation at the topmost story of the palace reveals the most innovative feature of this palace's architecture. This palace wasn't built on top of a hill as is conventionally done. It was built around it, its walls encasing it up to its peak. It was therefore possible to create a garden at the topmost level of the palace, where plants and trees are grown in the original soil, a unique way to integrate nature with architecture. The arches in polished marble constituting the exquisite audience hall and the colonnades of the cloisters surrounding the garden reveal a clear Mughal influence, though they have a peculiarly Mewari form. This fusion demonstrates that the synthesis of forms and building techniques visible in the architecture of Mandu, a kingdom ruled by a Muslim dynasty, was also present in a Hindu kingdom, though expressed differently. In Dathya and Orcha in Bundelkhand in central India, this synthesis was pushed even further. But unlike in Udaipur, here four different palaces were built by successive kings during the medieval period. The first palace, called Ramji Mandir, built by the founder of the dynasty, Raja Rudrapatap Singh, has a traditional square plan with a central courtyard, surrounded by royal apartments, arranged symmetrically next to one another. On its roof were eight symmetrically placed dome chambers, only four of which now survive. The second palace, called Raj Mahal, was started by Madhukar Shah. But in 1592, the Mughal Emperor Akbar invaded the kingdom as he had refused to accept the emperor's suzerainty. Akbar deposed Madhukar Shah, but generously allowed his son Ram Shah to succeed to his father's throne in 1592. Raj Mahal was finally completed by the new king. This palace is much larger and has two more stories, though it follows the same basic plan as the earlier palace. But here, rectangular chambers project onto the courtyard from the center of each side, creating terraces for the rooms above. Moreover, the architects replaced the domes of the previous palace on the top floor by small pavilions called chhatris. During this time, Ram Shah's brother, Veer Singh Deo, was plotting to relieve him of the throne. In 1602, he arranged for the murder of Akbar's friend and biographer, Abul Fazal, for Salim, Akbar's jealous son. Fazal was one of the foremost intellectuals of his time and greatly feared. 
the furious emperor invaded Orcha once again. But Veer Singh Deo escaped. When three years later, in 1605, Akbar died and Salim was crowned Emperor Jahangir, Veer Singh Deo was given the throne of Orcha and his brother, Ram Shah, deposed. Orcha's greatest poet, Keshav Das, who disapproved of Veer Singh Deo's immoral politics, was virtually driven out of Orcha by persistent neglect. Jahangir Mahal, Orcha's third palace, was named after the new emperor who had been a guest here. The plan of this three-storied palace is another variation around the idea of rooms placed symmetrically around a central courtyard. A square courtyard and dome chambers on the top floor are back as in the first palace. The rooms on the first floor are now larger, but the terraces are smaller than in the second palace. Moreover, unlike in the earlier palaces, the terraces on the first floor are enclosed within high walls. It is likely that contact with the Mughal court introduced a greater sensitivity to the separation of the sexes within the palace. Open roof terraces were, however, built on the second floor. The two upper levels now have a network of terraces that are placed between the central and corner chambers. For the first time in Orcha, chhatris are used effectively as focal centers of terraces. They reinforce the traditional spatial order and ingeniously interweave the two upper levels. Govind Mandir, the fourth and the last of the series of Bundela palaces, was built in nearby Datia. Once again we find a square plan which is symmetrical on all four sides, but this time there is a structure in the center of the courtyard. This was a daring break from tradition because according to the Mansara Shilp Shastra, Brahma, the Hindu god of creation, resides in the center of the courtyard, which should therefore always be kept empty. This five-storied central tower, which rises 130 feet, is the focal point of the palace. The two uppermost stories contain the king's private apartments. The three lower levels of the tower are connected by bridges on all four sides to the surrounding structure. This results in creation of four smaller intimate courtyards at the ground level. Here the harsh Indian sunlight is diffused in a more effective manner than in the traditional large central courtyard. The series of symmetrical visual and physical axes generated from this very original plan create a more complex yet harmonious order. The spirit of the traditional order is thus still respected despite revolutionary innovation. By experimenting, refining and ultimately transcending the traditional plan the Bundela architects of the 16th and early 17th century didn't allow themselves to be shackled by traditional rules, maintaining the link with the essence of a living tradition. Their open-minded attitude is also attested to in the bold and innovative design of the Chaturbhuj temple. The rulers of Orcha patronized the Vaishnav Bhakti sect. This Hindu reformist cult had a more egalitarian congregational form of worship. Large spaces were therefore required in the temple as it needed to accommodate vast numbers of devotees. The architects used massive shikharas outside to maintain the appearance of a traditional temple. 
but inside they boldly decided on the dome and arch structural system usually used in mosque architecture. This was done as it was the only familiar structural system that could create the immense congregational space they required. Thus, need for space led to a break from traditionally narrow and dark temple interiors. This demonstrates the open-minded and practical attitude prevalent during a period marked by the ascendance of the greatest of the Mughal emperors, Akbar. A Muslim himself, Akbar followed a state policy guaranteeing equal treatment to all religions. He formed close alliances with some of the Hindu Rajput kings who were given relative autonomy in their own kingdoms, provided they accepted Akbar's suzerainty as the emperor. Fatehpur Sikri, the new capital he created in 1571, is his vision in stone. A creation that is linked to the Sufis, free-thinking Islamic mystics, noted for their austerity and piety, who rejected official power. The story behind Fatehpur Sikri's creation, as popularized by Akbar's official chroniclers, is that Akbar desperate for a long-awaited son, went one day to Sheikh Salim Chishti, a pious Sufi living in a hut at Sikri. The Sheikh prophesied that Akbar would be blessed with not one, but three sons. Soon Akbar's Rajput queen, Jodhabai, gave birth to the first son. This son, who later became Emperor Jahangir, was named Salim in homage to the Sheikh. It was in recognition of the Sheikh's prophecy that Akbar decided to build a new capital at Sikri village. When Sheikh Salim Chishti died in 1571, Akbar built a magnificent tomb in his memory. A tomb which is to this day a pilgrimage site. By placing Sheikh Salim Chishti's tomb within Fatehpur Sikri's great congregational mosque, Akbar put both the orthodox and the mystic Indian Islam in the same space. By this, he affirmed the legitimate role of the Sufis in Islam, a symbolic and political statement that surely was deliberate. The way the Jama Masjid's main prayer hall's roof has been covered is another political sign. Though the main central dome is a conventional central squinch arch dome, the halls on both its sides have a flat ceiling supported by an elegant system of pillar and beam construction usually used in temples. The spirit of open-minded creativity is further demonstrated by the way the unusual ribbed domes in the two other halls are supported by the unique and highly original corbelled pendatives. Moreover, the domes are all crowned by Mahapadma and Kalash Finial. This traditional crowning element, often used in temple architecture, is actually a very practical waterproofing device. The palace's spatial planning was evolved from the Indian tradition of building around courtyards. The innermost courtyard is within the harem, popularly known as Jodhabai's palace. It is said that Jodhabai, Akbar's Rajput Hindu wife and mother of Jahangir, worshipped the Tulsi or the sacred basil, growing in this spot in the middle of the courtyard. The outermost courtyard is the Divaniyam, where Emperor Akbar held court for his common subjects. Apart from the public and the most private courtyards, there is a whole series of multifunctional spaces 
divided into two main zones separated by a wall. Attached to the wall separating the two sides is the intriguing many-pillared Panch Mahal. This five-storied structure, the highest in Fatehpur Sikri, was approached from the side next to the harem. Perhaps it was simply Akbar's meditation and leisure place, or even a vantage point from where the royal ladies watched the Pachisi court's activities. On one side of the Pachisi court is the Divane Khas. This is where Akbar met high officials and important court members. Some scholars believe this pillar symbolizes an ancient Indian concept according to which one axis or ek stamba sustains the cosmic order. Was this a representation of a cosmic pillar that sustained Akbar's rule? But the most astonishing aspect about Fatehpur Sikri is the exhilarating sense of freedom one feels while walking around the palace complex. This feeling can be explained by its very original composition. The conventional formal composition is usually based on the alignment of buildings on a central axis linked to rigid bilateral symmetries like in the presidential palace and the secretariat complex in New Delhi. A more subtle and delicate system of balancing axes is followed in Fatehpur Sikri. From one spot, the composition seems to be centered around a single axis. But as we move, we discover a series of other axes. This unusual system is complemented by the different views seen from various rooftops and floors of the buildings. This varied perception of space illustrates the concept of seeing things from many different angles, of evaluating in many different ways. It implies that though everything is related, absolutes are elusive. The harmony found in Fatehpur Sikri, despite the bewildering variety of forms, can be largely ascribed to the nearly exclusive use of sandstone, a locally quarried building material. This not only resulted in a unity of color and material, but also of scale, because at that time one could only build up to a certain height with this stone. The selection of sandstone reveals Akbar's practical and modest approach. Here was a man who was at the height of his power, an absolute monarch ruling a vast empire conquered by the sword. He could have made monumental buildings in marble covered with gold and precious stones as triumphant symbols of his power and wealth. Instead, he chose to create a subtle masterpiece in sandstone. Fatehpur Sikri's mystique has endured over the centuries because it is here, between 1571 and 1585, in those 14 years, that Akbar laid the foundation of a culture whose ideals continue to inspire us even today. <laughs>